Winter weather. Plan on it. A Fox 47 weather special starts now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Fox 47's first winter weather special. I'm Chief Meteorologist Brad Sugden. Now, of course, winter weather is all about perspective. You can love it or you can hate it, but we have you covered either way. Over the next half an hour, we'll break down the science of winters in Michigan, but also the fun and magic that those snowy days can bring. And that's a good segue into the start of our new weather brand called Plan On It. So plan on it might sound pretty self-explanatory, but there is a little more to it than you think. Of course, there's the basics. We'll be forecasting so you can plan your daily routine. You can do your weekend plans, plan your vacation, things like that. But you can also plan on us being there with the information that you need and how it caters and fits into your lifestyle. So we have forecasts for everything, every lifestyle that you can imagine, even how to do your hair football, baseball, right? Down to Jackson Field and Lansing, camping all over the area. And then also we're strong, knowledgeable, in-depth coverage of severe weather and not just severe weather, but of course winter weather because this is a winter weather special, right? And that'll be on air, online, and on our app. So we'll have everything you can imagine. Wind planners, neighborhood planners, La Nina, backyard grilling, great day outlook, how to do your hair, like I said, football, more football, fall colors, and then even your carnival and fair forecast once we get back into the season for that in the summertime. But also plan on us being there in your neighborhoods. It's hard to forecast when you don't know what's going on, right? We've been all over the place. So from Puama all the way down to St. John's, Fowler in between, we have the bridge there in Portland, the Capitol and all the snow the other day. In Lansing, we have Grand Ledge, Potterville, Island Park and Eaton Rapids. We have the museum there in Charlotte. We've been all over the place. Jackson, some beautiful photos with bright walls taking over the city. And then who can forget the architecture down to the south, right? We have Hillsdale and Hudson, just absolutely beautiful across the area. So that's how you can plan on it, not only for your forecast, but for us being in your neighborhoods as well. There are so many forecast details that you need to know while trying to juggle your busy lives, especially when Mother Nature throws us those snowy and icy curveballs. The first part of planning for this winter is looking back at the last several because, of course, this is our third La Nina in a row. So let's start by taking a look at the past couple of years and the snowfall that we've received. Notice the average is about 50 inches of snow, and well, within the last couple of years, we've definitely seen either or. Remember, I said we've had two La Ninas before this, slightly above above and slightly below in the last several years before that well generally coming in below average in terms of snowfall but these are just every single year not necessarily La Nina's or anything like that but last year was our second La Nina in a row we came in slightly above average on temperature a little bit above average on precip and then just for December January February we were a little bit above average in snowfall for those three months as well had some pretty warm days and some pretty cold ones coming our way as well the big takeaways from last year was we had records like crazy we had record highs in December. Then the Groundhog Day storm came in, dropping over a foot of snow in parts of Lansing. And while for Lansing, that Groundhog Day storm was actually the sixth biggest daily snowfall in history. So that was our second La Nina winter in a row. But what about this one? Is it different somehow or more of the same? Let's take a look. So let's talk a little bit about what La Nina is. It is not small scale, it is very large scale. It's actually on a global scale, and it happens all the way down at the equator. We have the trade winds, which I'm sure you've heard of, especially if there's any Pirates of the Caribbean fans in here. Now the trade winds blow from east to west. That is backwards from what we're used to, a little higher up in the northern hemisphere. So when those trade winds really get going, they take the warmer surface water and actually push it further back over to the west, over toward areas like the Philippines, northern Australia, Indonesia, so for them, that causes a warmer, wetter weather pattern, while over in the eastern part of the Pacific, we can get the upwelling of the cooler water. This does happen on the Great Lakes when we have a strong wind. That's why sometimes those beach temperatures definitely take a big plunge when we have a strong wind that's going offshore. Taking a look at last year, this is the cooler water along the equator indicated by the blue. And just a couple of days ago, you can see that there's a little bit more, but not much. It is actually very similar to what we've seen the last couple of years. So taking a look at the general pattern that we can expect from a La Nina, this is what typically happens when you look at any given year that we've recorded throughout history. Cooler off to the north, we're kind of in a wetter pattern with warmer down to the south. However, if you kind of keep in mind how a storm works and how it spins, we drag up the warmer air to the east with cooler air on the back, that would put us more toward the storm track. And that's why we generally have wetter conditions when we have a La Nina. Now that's not the case every single year. So let's take a look at the last several. Generally, as you can see, there's a lot 
more warmer years in terms of temperature when we have a La Nina compared to cooler or even average. In terms of precip, well, that's where things start to get a little more kind of consistent and more difficult to tell. Sure, we've had one more year that was below average compared to the same or above average, but we can't really, you know, make any determining factors based on that. And snowfall actually coming in about the same as well. So it is literally like a coin toss. We have equal chances of above or below, but generally a better chance of seeing above average temperatures moving on in. We'll tell you our predictions evolving this year's La Nina later on in the show, but first let's break down something that we've already dealt with this season. Different types of precipitation, and sometimes we get a lot of these in a single day. Well, let's talk about the different kinds of precipitation types that we see. Of course, we see a lot of them. We have different temperature profiles though in the atmosphere. So you have to think of the atmosphere like a stack of pancakes. We can have different temperatures at different heights, so different temperature pancakes, if you will. If it, they're all warm, we have rain. If there's one cool one on the bottom, that's when we get freezing rain. If there's a couple more, that's when those rain drops turn into sleet, those little balls that come on down. And of course, if it's all cold, you have all snow all the time. So we can have definitely a lot of different things based on how dynamic the weather is. Freezing rain causes issues, so does sleet, especially on a lot of roadways out there. So we have to look at not only what's going on with the storm system at the ground, but also higher up in the atmosphere. So those forecasts can definitely get a lot more difficult. And freezing rain is definitely one of the more rare conditions because it has to be almost perfect for that to happen. Just a little thin layer of about 28, 29, or even 30 degrees. And then sleet is when it gets a little bit thicker, like I said. So a lot going on in the atmosphere for these kinds of things to happen. Happen. Isn't the atmosphere incredible? Let's focus on one precip type in particular though, freezing rain, because a little bit goes a long way with this one and too much can wreak havoc on an area for weeks. So taking a look at what happens when this goes down is it sticks to everything, right? It's not just one power line, it's all of them and it is the power poles, it is the tree branches, roofs, things like that. Now, nuisance ice, about a tenth to a quarter of an inch, that can add up to 500 pounds of weight per span, and that just causes some slick roads and some minor damage. But then you get into a more significant ice storm, and that's when it really starts to accumulate, and then it really compounds and adds weight almost exponentially. So when we get toward a quarter of an inch, toward half of an inch, that's about 1,200 pounds of weight per span, or 30 times the normal weight of a tree branch. That's why they start to come crashing down. But then you get into the really significant ice storms, and these are rare, but they do happen where it just accumulates even more and it coats everything, causes a lot of sag on the power lines because of the weight. So half of an inch to an inch of ice, that can add up to 3,300 pounds of weight per span, and that's per power line. That's when roads can become impassable from tree branches falling, power lines falling, things like that. And we have had that happen across our area before. In fact, it was just back in 2013, right before Christmas, that that did happen. 650,000 people lost power and up to three quarters of an inch of ice accumulated along parts of I-69, which you can see on this map here very well, just north of Lansing. And you know a lot of those power outages were in parts of Ingham County over towards Shiawassee and Genesee County because of the core of a lot of that ice accumulating there. So thankfully this type of weather event is quite rare. Speaking of how icy roads and snow can cause big travel issues, let's toss it over to Michaela Temple now, who did some digging into how a local road commission plans their attack on wintry weather. Well, we've been pretty lucky this week seeing no snow stick to the ground, but with our first winter storm behind us, I think it's safe to say that we're all preparing for what's ahead. When winter weather hits, most of us hunker down, others head out into the elements. We monitor the weather just like you guys do, and uh, all of our vehicles are prepped, they're fueled, they're mechanically sound. At MDOT, that means long days for snowplow drivers. If it's a large event, uh, we have them on uh, two 12-hour shifts, so we have 24-hour manning. Jenkins says with a few local partners, MDOT covers a lot of ground. The Grand Ledge Garage has 24 trucks covering 362 area lane miles. The Charlotte Garage has 13 trucks covering 355 miles. Williamston with 16 trucks covering 236 miles. Mason with 11 trucks and 255 miles. And the Clinton County Road Commission covers 244 lane miles, with the city of East Lansing and Lansing also covering roads within their city limits. Together, it's thousands of miles, but not all roads are created equal. The most traveled get top priority. Like 496 or I-96, uh, M50, M100, you know, we're 
we're we're uh, making sure those roads are clear for you. Our goals of providing pavement surface pavement surface is generally bare of ice and snow. And with the first snowstorm of the year under our belts, Jenkins has an important reminder for drivers. When you encounter some of our professionals out there driving, make sure you give them room to do what they need to do. Your neighborhood reporter in Lansing, Michaela Temple, Fox 47 News. Well, you gotta love science, right? Now, while some of us like science, others don't really care so much about it. Some people just want to know, is school closed? Yes or no? Or what they can do for some fun out in that snow. So stick around. Coming up after the break, our Joe Gebhardt will tell us what goes into calling a snow day. And our Tiana Jenkins will have some fun things to do out in the wintry weather. We'll be right back. Here to keep you prepared. Fox 47 weather. Plan on it. Welcome back. We've all watched TV, hit refresh on the school's website, or sat by our phones waiting for that sweet news of a snow day. Well, what actually goes into making that call? And no, it is not done by the meteorologist. Our Joe Gebhardt asked one school district how they do it. It can sometimes be a kid's best surprise, snow days. Yes, I can finally sleep in. That's my first thought. And just being able to chill, really. To have more, because I think it's also not only a break for the students, it's a break for the teachers. Because even when we have days off, sometimes they still have to come. Well, snow days are synonymous with winter weather in Michigan for students. But what goes into making that call to give your kid the day off? Sometimes we know in advance the storm is coming. And uh, so we start talking about it the day before. We start prepping for it um, sometimes earlier in the week if we're kind of watching big systems move in. And when we know with a reasonable certainty that the weather's gonna get here, we try our best to call the night before. If they can't do it in advance, 5.30 a.m. is their deadline as buses typically leave around 6 a.m. And once they're on the road, you can't really cancel school. I've got a crew, uh, it's about nine guys that come in. They're plowing the roads or plowing our parking lots out. And they start that around 2.30 in the morning. And then about 4, 4.30 in the morning, I start talking to my director of operations and Todd Fry and I have conversations. I've got a chat group that, that's bouncing around again between superintendents so that I can hear what roads look like. The state allots six active God days. Beal says they don't have any thresholds for amount of snowfall that would cause them to call off. But if temperatures dip to a sustained negative 20 degrees, they'll keep students home, making it a collaborative effort with other school districts to keep students safe. And I always do that based on the recommendations of a lot of people around me, right? So I take a look at what's, ever, what, what, what's the transportation director in Vandercook Lake saying? What's Western doing? What's Northwest doing? They're out driving the roads too. And so I get a lot of miles on a lot of roads that, that comes back to us and we, we get all of that information. And that's really how we make decisions. But if kids do get that call? I encourage every child out there, do all the snow day tricks you can. They're all fun and games. and. Uh, you know, my goal is to get everybody here. Your Jackson neighborhood reporter, Joe Gebhardt, Fox 47 News. Thanks, Joe. So now the school is closed. What do you do? Of course, if the weather is really bad, you are encouraged to stay home, but sometimes it clears up partway through the day. Our Tiana Jenkins joins us now with some things to do in the snowy weather. Michigan's winter is upon us and we can't just let it go by without getting outdoors and embracing it. So here's a look at two winter activities you can check out. If you're looking out your window and see a winter wonderland, that's the best time to try out cross-country skiing. If you can walk, you can cross-country ski. Fitzgerald Park in Grand Ledge has approximately three miles of trails that would make it easy for you to have snow much fun. We have a one loop that we kind of consider our beginner's loop. That's also the loop that we will light on, on ski fest nights on Friday and Saturday evenings with snow permitted. And you don't even need your own equipment. They will hook you up with rentals. And if the cold outdoors is too much for you, there's some spots where you can sharpen those ice skating skills. Optimus Ice Arena, Mun Ice Arena, and Suburban Ice Skating Rink are all family friendly places you can get your skate on. Well, that's all I have for you guys. Remember to have fun and also bundle up this winter. Keeping you in the loop with things to do, I'm your neighborhood reporter, Tiana Jenkins. 
Thanks, Tiana. Well, nothing says winter like some good old fashioned or Olympic style skating, right? Now, you know, it is important to remember that it's not just what's coming down out of the sky that can ruin our day. It is the wind and the cold out there that can really make or break an enjoyable day or evening outside. So let's talk about how wind chill works. Of course, we lose body heat when we're outside, right? Especially when it's colder out. But 20 degrees when there's no wind, you kind of build this little bubble of warm air around your body. And that helps to insulate you from the actual cold temperatures outside. So when there's no wind, 20 degrees feels like 20 degrees. Now, there is a mathematical formula on how we figure out what it feels like when the wind blows that warm air away from your body. So 20 mile per hour wind, you lose that insulating layer and that 20 degrees ends up feeling like four degrees and that's why it's so important to bundle up because you can get hypothermia pretty quickly out there now just a couple of weeks ago when we had the lake effect come on through we were about 20 25 degrees go down to maybe some 30 mile per hour wind gusts and that puts us in the single digits which is what a lot of us were experiencing and that is certainly cold now let's say we go way back to when we had the polar vortex coming right temperatures are about 10 to 15 degrees below wind speeds about 25 to 30 so that puts us down in the minus 30 degree range which we've seen before but it's definitely rare and anything colder than that is exceptionally rare for the state of Michigan. It <laughs> hurts my face just to think about it. Well, we've had some pretty cold wind chill values with our lake effect snow a couple of weeks ago and yesterday, near zero in some cases actually. Now, windy cold conditions can also bring us that dreaded lake effect snow. And here's how the winds do that. Now, the difference in the temperature between the lake and the air is the key forecast element, but the wind is, of course, what carries it over the lake and a little further on inland. So there's kind of a couple of things that need to happen here. It's not as easy as every time we get a west and northwest wind. The difference in the temperature between the lake and about a mile up in the air should be about 13 degrees Celsius. Of course, if it's more than that, that's great. That means that we get some heavier lake effect snow to come on too. So the greater the difference, the greater the opportunity of some heavy lake effect snow like what we saw just just a week or two ago across much of the state. Then you have the fetch, and the fetch is what was the gathering of the moisture over the lake. So the longer that is, the more moisture is gathered. Notice when we have a northwest wind, you get that southwest area getting a lot of snow as well as the northwest. But then every now and then, like what we had a couple of weeks ago, we get it wrapping around the lake from the west, southwest. And for our area, that means a big wide area of Lake Michigan and it drags it further inland. And that's when the snow really starts to dump on our area. So wind direction and the temperature difference are key. And part of the reason that happens is, well, lake effect snow and system snow have to do with the snow liquid ratio. If you ever heard of the saying one inch of rain equals 10 inches of snow, there is a little bit of truth to that, but also not quite. So here's what happens with that. Let's say one inch of water, different temperatures can equal different amounts of snow. When you have 34 degrees, it's a heavy wet snow, right? It's a lot of slush on the ground. So one inch of water might only equal about five inches. But then let's say you're in the sweet spot, just below freezing with 30 degrees, one inch of water will likely equal about 10 inches of snow. But then it's really cold out, right? You got a lot of wind out there, 18 degrees. That's when one inch of rain can equal about 20 inches of snow because you have a lot going on there and some flakes add up and you get more air in between them and stuff like that. There's also a bunch of different kinds of snowflakes. You have thin plates, needles, columns, cellar plates, and dendrites. I know there's a lot going on there, but basically they compact more or they don't. Notice when we start getting into those colder temperatures over here, especially when you get down to the teens, that's when you get those plate snowflakes and plate snowflakes add up with a lot of air in between them. So that's why one inch of rain can equal a lot more than 10 inches of snow because there's a lot of air in there as well. And the colder it gets, the faster it'll pile up. Now, all these different snow events, cold, wind chills, can trigger various advisories and warnings. Which ones are the worst and which ones aren't? Let's break it all down for you. So there's several different kinds. We have, of course, your typical warning, which means now or imminent. And anytime there's a warning, whether it's tornado, severe thunderstorm, or especially blizzard in the wintertime, winter storm warning, that means that conditions do pose a threat to life and property. That means that it is honestly pretty dangerous outside at times. Then we have an advisory, which is also now or imminent. And we had this issued with the winter weather advisory when we had our lake effect. Now it's far less serious than a warning, but they still can cause a lot of inconvenience. In this case, in the wintertime, usually snowy road conditions. Now a watch, that's when we're watching for changes. But what you can do is start a plan. So if there's ever a winter storm watch 
or a blizzard watch or anything like that, that's when we have to start making a plan. But keep in mind that the forecast can sometimes change. So let's talk about a blizzard warning. That is when we are within 12 to 36 hours of it happening. Do not travel, especially during a blizzard warning, because that one means very, very low visibilities. Winter storm warning, same thing. But there's some criteria that we have to meet for a blizzard warning we'll look at in just a moment. But still, considerable travel problems are likely not only driving, but air travel as well. And a winter weather advisory, again, and that's the lower one. It means we'll have travel difficulties, and if you can stay off the roads, that's definitely a good idea. Taking a look at the definition of a blizzard, we have to have winds of 35 miles per hour or greater, consistently gusting that way, visibility less than a quarter of a mile, and it has to be for three consecutive hours, if you didn't realize that, can cause rapidly deteriorating road conditions and honestly can be extremely dangerous, because if you get stranded, somebody might not be able to come help. Well, we've reached that part of the show that you've all been waiting for. What is this winter going to bring us? Coming up in just a little bit, we'll have the winter season outlook. But first, how the Great Lakes can actually offer us a helping hand sometimes. We'll be right back. Here to keep you prepared. Fox 47 weather. Plan on it. All right, well, this is it, the moment that we've all been waiting for, the winter season outlook. We have the Farmer's Almanac, the National Weather Service, and of course our own. So many options to choose from. Let's start off by taking a look at the Farmer's Almanac. This always grabs a lot of attention every single year when it comes out. Lots of fun words here too, like significant shivers and slushy in the Northeast. Technically for us, they are going with unseasonably cold and then hibernation zone. Gotta love those fun words that they use, right? Here's like the National Weather Service in terms of precip. There's a 50% chance of above average precipitation from December, January to February, but that also means that there's just a smaller chance of below Low average but the odds are leaning towards wetter than normal now in terms of temperatures right in the middle here which also kind of puts us on the storm track so we can see below average that's the better odds off to the northwest and better odds of above average down to the south so we can go either way this means we have equal opportunity for below average or above average once we start to get through December, January, and February. So very interesting to see how that will play out as it is just about every year. So taking all this into account, and of course we saw earlier in the show that we looked at La Nina as well, this is what we're going to go with here at Fox 47. We're going to say above average in terms of temperatures for December, January, and February. We're going to go with about average for precipitation and then slightly above average on snowfall just because we can get some of those colder blasts coming on and at times that tends to cause those to pile up just a little bit quicker or a lake effect event like what we had a couple weeks ago. So who do you think will be right? We'll have to wait and see exactly what happens, but hopefully you enjoyed the fun science and maybe even learned something tonight. Thanks so much for watching everyone and please be safe and try to be happy this winter season.